Praise God, and thank you for joining us for the Peterson Chronicles, Angel Wars and Luciferian Rebellion, show number 222. Hey, uh, it looks like that I need I need to have the uh, buzzer award for the day. Uh, no, no, my multi-buzzer award, that's what I'm thinking. Yep, I'm, so I'm feeling kind of like that's what I ought to have, because I'm pretty sure, although I ha- don't really have the time to go back and look, uh, I'm pretty sure by looking at my notes and everything that I dorked up uh, the uh, actual number of the last show. I think I said it was 203 or something like that. I was worried because I, I looked at the label uh, that I put on the program, but this, that, and the other thing, and all the data and the metadata and all that, blah, 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 blah. And uh, yeah, I think I dorked it up. So anyway, so for those of you who are regular listeners of the program, who listened to the last show on last Saturday night, and you were like, wait a minute, why is he saying 203? It shouldn't be 203. It should be 222 or two whatever, you know, 221 or whatever. Uh, you know what? Okay, you know, I, I let me tell you something, folks. I, over the last couple of weeks, now I'm recovering. I, I'm, a, I'm a recovering. Um, I don't know. What, what do you call it when you're mentally beat into the ground with your and you have to like dig your head out from like you know four feet beneath the dirt? But anyway, uh, last couple of weeks have been very challenging for me. Praise Jesus, Hallelujah! I'm uh, very glad I didn't have to travel to San Francisco to take the beating. Uh, I was able to do it remotely, but nevertheless, a uh, beating, uh, very hard, very challenging. And then on top of it all, the computer crashed. My uh, work, my work laptop, just absolutely. I, I've in all my years. Oh my goodness, thirty plus years, I have never had a computer just go pow. I mean, it was literally, I mean, if, if there was an appropriate sound effect for my, what happened with my computer, it would pretty much be, you know, this. <laughs> I mean, it was like that kind of a thing. It was unbelievable. I, anyway, I lost a bunch of data. And uh, by, uh, by some supernatural um, stuff that occurred, I had, uh, I had a long, long time ago, I bought a voice recorder and, um, and it's, it's very common, you know, with, uh, with business, you know, uh, uh, what do you call them? Um, uh, video conferencing calls like WebExes and things like that to use the recording feature. So, uh, uh I was using a, a, a similar recording type of feature and, Fortunately, I was able to go back to the uh, the the interview processes and um, uh, pull out the audio. I had to sit there and play a little bit, and then transcribe it, and play a little bit because you know a lot of these people, a lot of the folks I you know would interview with, they you know they're, they're not they don't speak English as their first language, and you know it's really hard. And then they're throwing in all these acronyms about agile development and sprints and this is and that's and pipelines and acronyms and uh, you know and all these different things and I'm, I'm, you know, and of course I'm supposed to be taking notes as fast as they're talking, and then it would, go, it would jump over to another guy, and then another guy in the room would start talking, to another guy with, and they would all be, you know, from some other place, and you know, and, and a different accent. And I'm like, oh my gosh, and and then I realized when my when when my computer went like, you know, I mean, I was like, okay, this can't be happening to me. Well, I, I thought it was better than it was because it, cause Windows has a thing where it you know, kind of does like this last minute, oh, my gosh, I'm going to crash, so I'm going to save a quick snapshot of the, of the file that you're working on, so if it's a spreadsheet or whatever. And um, so I, I didn't worry about it. I really didn't. I didn't sweat it that much. I was very frustrated that the interview got you know, and all that. What I didn't know was that that following Monday when I went into my spreadsheet, which is the hmm, the Crown Prince Royale of all things for you know a ninety thousand dollar project for an extremely huge multinational billion multi billion dollar company, and I'm point I'm in, okay, <laughs> just so you know, and um, I'm like on, uh, oh, oh, where where's all the data on this tab? Wait, wait. Oh, I couldn't believe it. And it turns out not only did I lose the data from uh one of the most important people on the in the entire interview queue, um but I also lost an entire interview with three other individuals from a nut that covered multiple tabs of information and it was just unbelievable. It was it was so the stress the stress that I was undergoing was you, you really just can't put words around it. I mean, the only thing, you know, that I can, there's nothing in my, let's just put it this way. In my life, I cannot think 
of I actually had less stress when my uh, second wife, uh, back when I was seeping in sin and doing everything wrong and not seeking God and not looking for a godly wife and all that kind of stuff. When my second wife um, backed up one that I loved very dearly and, and caught over the telephone because she accidentally forgot to hang up the phone. I caught over the telephone. She continued, you know, told with her lie where she was and then um, forgot to hang up the phone and, um, you know, continued to go back to her activities with her uh, residual male friend, if you will. So I got to hear it, you know, in 3D Technicolor. Uh, and then to top that all off and make that even worse, she backs up. I go out on another consulting trip. She backs up a truck and literally empties my house. Now, now, you, now, I know people say emptying your house. They say things like that, and you're know, like, you, 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 you kind of like smile a little bit because you're like, well, yeah, they took a bunch of stuff. No, this was the real deal, folks. I literally came back from the consulting visit, and when I walked into this house, and it's just a two thousand square foot two story. It's nothing, you know, to check, you know, well, so you live in a big house and nothing like that. It's just a regular average old house. And um, uh, yeah, I came, when I opened up the door and came walking in, I, my whole, I went flush. I mean, I could feel, you ever have that rush, you know, that rush feeling where uh, you feel the blood draining from the top of your body all the way down? <laughs> because I walked in and everything was gone. It was like I was doing a walkthrough in a house that was for sale. You could hear your sneakers on the tile making an echoing clip clop sound as you walked through looking around in the rooms. It was all gone. Except, I gotta be honest, I don't want to leave this out. Except for a dining room table with a broken leg and a missing chair. Even the yard on the wall. <laughs> and I'm not talking about, you know, really fancy, fancy yard or anything like that. I'm just talking about, like, you know, pictures, you know, uh, Angel Adams and stuff like that. You know, st- you know, cheap stuff that you pick up for 22 bucks or something, whatever. But, but it was all gone. Everything was gone. And the week I had, last week and the week before, all combined and summed up and rolled up into one big old nice Tootsie Roll from the bowels of work she old, topped it. Absolutely blew that week away. I, I would take three trucks moving my house out from some ex and, and all that stress. I, you know, I would, I would take you know, losing my job and getting kicked out into the quad and saying, you know, we don't want you to work here anymore. You know, whatever the case may be, I would take that stress over what I would do the last couple of weeks. It was unbelievable. And it was like, I'm like, where's the data? And then, thank you, Jesus, uh, you know, I, I discovered that some of the recordings had worked in the la And long story short, after quite a bit, I mean, literally two days worth of going through all this, you know, all these recordings and pressing play for two or three seconds and then pause and play and pause and play and pause and take notes and pause and play and pause and play and take notes. I finally was able to repopulate some of the tabs and get everything back together. And I, I could go on and on and on. But anyway, it's just been incredible. So there's my excuse. Hallelujah. There is my excuse for uh, dorking up the show number for last week. All right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I, I, yeah, exactly. So, that you know, what, 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 what are you going to do? You're just going to keep on going along and, and keep on waking up, going to sleep. Nope, Jesus is not here. Uh, uh, okay, I'll wake up and go, you know, okay, here we go again. All right. And then, you know, and then you, you, you hope and you pray and you cry and you... You wake up again. Nope, Jesus isn't here. <laughs> and you go, oh boy. And can you imagine what it must have been like to have been, been part of the early church? I mean, the really early church, like, you know, the Bogomils or the Polissians, you know, when they were being hunted, you know, when the very sound of horseback coming through the forest meant that your children were likely going to be killed in front of your eyes. Can you imagine that? And we complain because we lose a tab of information on an Excel spreadsheet, right? <laughs> Are you serious? Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious, Pastor Paul, for crying out loud. Oh, my gosh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. It looks like uh – uh-oh. Okay. um, This is very unusual. Uh, Line 12 is lighting up on the uh, radio show Red Phone. Line 12. 
And, uh, you know, I don't know some of the electronics and the wiring and the interconnections that are that are built into the Golden JIB Jesus and Broadcasting Studios here in Golden, beautiful downtown Tampa, Florida. But um, I think this one might be connected to the Hubble Space Telescope. I, I don't – some kind of – relays and switches through supercomputers or whatever but line 12 I don't recall that one ever light lining lighting up before I I'm not sure who this could be let okay I reluctantly think maybe I should pick this up we, we are from planet Bokhtar we are a new civilization of the galactic federation and we know your name and we know where you live. We are called the Pop Tartonians. Pop Tartonians, and you have to leave the pause between the Pop and the Tart. Or you're retarded, in our opinion. And you, Brother Peterson, we see you on the callback. We control your time. We control your electronics. You think we're on the devil. We have news for you. We are far more sinister than he ever was. And we know who you are. And we are coming for you. Oh, holy mackerel. Oh, my gosh. I thought that might be Hillary Clinton. Uh, it, was a, it was the Pop-Tart, wait, Pop-Tartonians. Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh man. Uh, boy, hey, 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 yeah, yeah, come here, come here. Over here. Over here. Come this way. I'd much rather get on that helicopter than deal with the Pop-Tartonians. Oh, man, holy mackerel. Whew. Oh, man. Oh. Hey, do you remember this? Do you remember this? I don't know. A lot of people, I think, have forgotten this. But li- did you know that 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 guy who gives me, I don't know, he gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um, but that guy ca- called Greg on the five, um, you know, the five on Fox News. And all I got to say is anybody can, who can watch that program, you know, the five and come out of it, you know, come out of watching it, you know, without some sort of brain damage. <laughs> You're a better person than I am. I cannot possibly. I mean, are you kidding me? Uh, and, and, and and that whole uh, Kimberly Guilfoyle thing and all that and creepy weirdness and people coming forward out of Fox going, I can't work here anymore. I've been here for 10 years and I can't stand it. They're telling me to praise Trump and I can't, you know, they're telling us what to say. It is a Trump propaganda station. I quit. And it's true. It's documented. There are these, a lot of these people coming right out, and they're doing just like Trump, and they're twittering it out there, twittering it out there. I can't, I can't wait until somebody comes out, uh, uh, you know, right out on stage at, at one of the, you know, the White House press conferences and says, you know, we are from planet. No, I'm, just, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But anyway, but listen to this. You remember that uh, this guy Greg on the five came out and actually said this. I'm going to play this for you. Listen carefully to what he said. Now, is it because, you know, he cruises around YouTube and says, oh, gee, that's really fascinating. I wonder if that's true. Do you think he's a personal friend of Fitzgerald? Hmm? Do you think he knows what's going on in the House of Windsor? Why do you think he said this? Or is he one of them? I don't know. This is really weird. He said it live on The Five. Listen to this. Picks announced so far have all been white men, so the pressure is on. Trump transition officials insist that the team the president-elect ultimately puts together will represent a cross-section of America. And goodness gracious, they've really only announced three or four actual picks, Greg. You think you can maybe, like... Hold on before they say it's like too white and male. Uh, there's, have, uh, there's not a single reptile in the cabinet. <laughs> what do you think? Hmm? 
what you think. See, I could go off on the counter and tell pro and how it works and how you smirk and speak the obvious. You know, and you smirk while you're saying it, like, at least he didn't pick a reptile in his cabinet. <laughs> Those guys are a bunch of crazy nutbags. I mean, my gosh, they're all a bunch of, they're payday bars. They're absolutely not. They had they do too much fluoride in their water. Their fluoride filter got backed up. A chunk of it went down their throat. They're lucky to be alive. Yeah. Hey, wake up! Yeah, the situation is pretty gruesome out there. <laughs> it's going to be getting a lot more gruesome. A lot more gruesome. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, <clears throat> now um, I'm going to go ahead and – hold on a second. I wanted to uh, I wanted to go ahead and – let me look at this a second. Okay. I wanted to do a little bit of a blast from the past because we haven't really done this for a while. And hold on a second. got to get all my widgets and gadgets and gadgets and levers and wires and cables and schmables and switches lined up just right in order to make this work. Okay, so let me see if I can find this. Um, all right. All right. Cool. Uh, is a – there we go. Um, all right. Yeah, that's the one I wanted to get. Okay, here we go. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play, listen very carefully, because while this guy is without a doubt the fringiest of the fringe, I mean, if there was like, you know, if there was like a parsect of the universe that was known as parsect fringe, this guy's already like 30 million light years past the edge of that fringe, <laughs> okay? But I believe him. And he believes that Jesus is God and is his Lord and Savior, which is really cool. And supposedly worked inside the black ops and in and, and, and deep black ops and, you know, unacknowledged special access programs and all that kind of creepy Phil Schneider stuff. And it had been privileged to meet uh, as a physician with, um, you know, entities. Um, but anyway, I wanted to play this. This one is entitled Hillary Clinton is a Draco reptilian monstrosity with, with, and it has a long explanation and even mentions some things about Obama. It's kind of long, but I want, I wanted to play this because, uh, well, you know, quite, quite honestly, I know parts of it, you know, parts of it, you know, um, I don't know. I remember parts of it really well, but I don't remember every little thing. And that's one of the reasons why I like to go back and do the little blast from the past thing myself now and then, because it refreshes my memory of some of the things that I think are going to come back. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if this is the right way of putting it, but come back and <clears throat> haunt us. If you know what I mean. All right, let's listen to this. Again, this is Dr. Bill Deagle uh, in regard to Hillary Clinton and also with a mention of Obama. Let's hear what he has to say. This is about nine minutes long, but uh, I suspect it's really good. Also, I wouldn't have bothered to put it up on the radio show program uh, console board, I don't think. Um, well, I don't think. Or, or else I had a really bad week and it's got all kinds of silly stuff in it from, you know, Planet Pop-Tart. The British royal family and all the royals of the world and all the high-level masons, the highest level that a human being can reach is the 180th degree. The highest degree possible by any being is the 360th degree, which is Lucifer, Satan, and light bearer. Now, people say that's all theoretical, it's not real. Yes, it is real. And there's not only human, but non-human, uh, if you want to call it, uh, avatars of these higher orders of control. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is that through the ancient high priests of Sumer, Egypt, etc., they have combined, as it says in the book of Daniel, that clay or human flesh with iron, which are these, if you want to call it memes or entities mm -hmm. that are, in a sense, disembodied entities mm -hmm. that can avatar the physical flesh of a human. The way they do it is real simple. They do sex magic rituals. They shatter their personality and they create an altar, which is a place where these... Well, they can... They, wanna, it's exactly. like a computer bus. You know, you could have a place in your computer so you can stick a chip. Yeah. So, ah, yeah. there's a bus yeah. there. I take this chip, which is this transdimensional entity, go in and it takes over your hard drive and your control of your computer. Well, it's exactly. We have to take a break here. Uh, they used to call them walk-ins, but I like your analogy better. Yeah, it's Stand a better way. Yeah, now, they know by. this technology. This is how all the royals, mm -hmm. all of the high-level masons, 
-hmm. Basically, it talks in the Bible and Daniel about the clay and iron. Clay meaning human flesh, iron meaning these entities. And many people would give themselves up so that they would gain, quote, godlike powers of, you know, talent or music or uh, intellectual powers or whatever. And they create these altars so they have what's called DID or dissociative identity disorder or MPD. These are manufactured, and you actually see it through families. Mm -hmm. And all of, and the most powerful thing you can do in high-level masonry isn't mass murder or abortion. It's to curse your own descendants through these rituals so that they can be avatared by these entities. Well, they, what happens, we'll go through the break. Uh, we were late getting Bill on. Listen, uh, what happens is relatively simple if you can pull back and look at it. The human mind can be fragmented into dozens of different altars or right. sub-personalities, whatever you want to call it. Right. And what Bill is saying is correct. Now, the, yeah, human experiential and behavioral response subroutines. In other words, it's a way of coping that involves a, a sub-portion of what a person is as a human. Correct. So you can and have, it, and these were purposely it, designed, by the way, with the Reiki and mind control that was incorporated by the CIA going back as long as the Second World War, yeah. to create super spies that had photographic memories and had super skills that would be useful for downloading information they or needed, doing certain things. They needed a compartmentalizable mind to use so they could right. plug in their little chips and have them operate on uh, bases that the normal psyche could never handle. Right. Uh, and what happens with a lot of these families, of course, and this has been talked about for years on this program and, and I'm sure on your program, is that they'll actually sacrifice uh, within the blue blood realm their own. One one member of their family will get sacrificed. I'm not talking about killed. I'm talking about sacrifice to the, the cult. Given over to the dark side. The dark, the SRA. Satanic ritual abuse. They'll give them right. over. They have, they'll have fragment their personalities. And every time they're violated, raped, robbed, whatever it is, they, they form another altar. And it ends right. up with dozens and dozens or hundreds and hundreds. And, and they'll keep these people basically in, the, in their portfolio of usable tools, they being the cult, for life. Right and now. if and if they don't work out, they'll suicide them. They well, suicide them out. Two very prescient examples, because I know we talked about Hillary Clinton, where they basically said, now, if she goes for the uh, nomination for uh, the 2016 presidency in the Democratic Party, she's got it. Major groups are now coming behind her. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, so he, she, her family are the Rodhams. The Rodhams have been known as high-level satanic ritual abuse, pedophile, flesh-eating, Satanists for hundreds and hundreds of years. Do you know that? Uh, go ahead. Bring me back I, to Great Britain. I mean, this, this family is... The, the Rodhams are... are the warlocks. They're, they're, they're blue blood Brits? Blue blood, blood flesh-eating warlocks. And witches. All right. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, another one who uh, uh, has been avatared is Mr. Barack Obama. And if you yeah. actually look at Barry, uh, Barry uh, Sotoro, a.k.a. Barack Obama... His biological father not only sodomized him when he was visiting him in Hawaii, but uh, this young man had his, his, uh, his uh, altars or his mind shattered. The prime example is when you find somebody that is what I call a super narcissist, they've always gone through sexual magic ritual and ritual abuse. Mm. Always. Mm -hmm. And you find different altars. Some of those altars may be normal intelligence. Some maybe have unusual skills. The, uh, certain altars, for example... Uh, there was recently, uh, <clears throat> I became aware of this, and I can't remember the name of the football player, but one of his altars as a football player was a top all-star, and the other altar was like a like a cringing little boy. And they didn't necessarily know each other. So we're not talking about just a dissociative identity where they kind of know each other kind of peripherally. We're talking about a total split. Got it. Yeah. Now, Obama is one of those. You do not get in a position of power in our world as a government leader. Never. Unless you are put through this procedure. That's right. They don't play games. They don't play games. When, um, <clears throat> because I have, you know, gone through the experience of dying at birth in eight and a half, I have what is a gift called second sight. You've probably heard of this before. Mm -hmm. Where you can see in the spirit realm. Right? Absolutely. And when I met, yeah, when I met uh, Hillary Bill Clinton, he came in Marine One helicopter at Dakota Ridge High School <clears throat> back in, uh, in uh, 2000. Uh, they were visiting Colorado because of Columbine, and I took care of the first young man shot in Columbine and saved his life, Mark T Taylor. Uh, we were invited as the first level guest to actually spend several hours with Bill and Hillary Clinton. Now, Bill Clinton, you wouldn't trust him. 
you'd probably go out and fish or have a beer with him, but you wouldn't feel in, in abject danger. You know he's slimy. You know he's crooked, and anything that comes out of his mouth. You you, you, you just said you would. He, he's a good old boy. He's got that no abject danger. <clears throat> you're right. Right. When I went in the presence of Hillary Clinton, now I, I, just to give you a sidelight, uh, I've done probably more things in my life than most people with 12 lifetimes. When I did my internal medical residency in Vancouver in 1977-78, um, I took care of, we would have prisoners that fly in from all over Canada to what's called the Supermax Psychiatric Mass Murderer Banfield Pavilion. And they actually had lockdown where all the prisoners were chained to their bed and had armed guards in every room. Right? Mm -hmm. So I was called to see one guy because they thought he may have had diphtheria because he had a diphtheroid presentation in his soft palate and other things. So I was supposed to examine this man with mask and glove and the proper reverse protection. But they had two men, both armed with shotguns, <clears throat> and the man was chained at the neck, arms and legs. Okay? Huh. Uh -huh. He jumped up with his chains trying to see if he could get the chains around me when I was examining him. <clears throat> and there's other times when I take care of people on PCP or drugs or murderers that you know are being transferred. But when I met Hillary Clinton, she was thousands of times more evil than any other individual I've ever met. On, in a palpable, dark majesty of evil, liquid, satanic Lilith, daughter of Lucifer himself. Wow. Kind of Okay. Wow. Did you, look her, in, did you hand, look her in the eye? Yes, I looked in her eye, straight in her eye. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was not a diminutive, you know, relatively short, uh, plainly dressed, but, you know, cold-faced. Her hand was as cold as a wet mackerel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and her stare was like looking right into, into death. Mm -hmm. But when I looked at her, I could see in the other dimensional plane, uh, not a five foot three or four diminutive female, I saw a 14 to 16 foot Draco reptilian monstrosity. Oh, the weather outside is frightful. Do 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 Weird. You know what? I had done research for years and years and years and years. And years and years and years and years to the detriment of my marriage and everything else because, you know, and written 420 articles and a whole bunch of this stuff. Had Steve Quayle contact me directly to get a hold of several of the articles that I wrote to get permission so that he could reprint them in one of his books. Blah, 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 on and on and on and on and on. And, um, you know, I'm – that's all real stuff. I've had personal experience with this stuff. <laughs> for real, for real. Um, and I'm here to tell you, folks, that's the, probably just the tip of the iceberg. And what we don't really realize is how pervasive it is. And pervasive means it's everywhere. Again, back in 1993, it was estimated by somebody such as Dr. Deagle that was in the know that one in 43, this is 93, think about where we are in comparison to 93. That one in 43 individuals is one of them. Now, when you walk into a Walmart and you're standing in a line and there's like, say, four registers full of people, count the people quick. One of them is one of them. That was in 93. What about today? What about what's been going on heavily since then? How much more, if you will, pervasive is S-R-A-D-I-D today? How many more mind control, Fritz Springmeier Illuminati mind control slaves exist now that are part of the Blue Bloods and outside of the Blue Bloods? How many more are there per capita? Have you ever considered that? If in 93, 1 in 43 was one of them, e.g. not even a human at all, OK, then um, with all the programs that have been in play now on a global level, all right, all any, you know, any I've heard I've even heard I've heard some wacky stuff like, you know, alien abductions have subsided over the last couple of years and everything. I'm like, you know, baloney, baloney. No way. All lies. 
all lies from the devil. If anything, it's way, way worse. The situation, and by the way, as time goes on, Lucifer's technologies and his minions' methodologies become more, well, effective. See, that's one of the things that I have a hard time sometimes explaining to folks. I've, I've had a conversation with a pastor who's traveling around with another very famous pastor, and they're doing divine healing and everything like that, and it's really wonderful. Praise God. I, I just I, I, I praise Jesus. Now, I was born and raised in that. I was born and raised going from place to place, uh, you know, uh, with my mother from one, you know, essentially Smith Wigglesworth uh, revival to another. And so to me, that while it, while like, you know, I gush with tears and I'm overwhelmed with the presence of the Holy Spirit like anybody would be and just like, oh, wow, praise God. To me, it just it doesn't have the same allure that it would have to somebody who only in the last eight or nine years has been, you know, even aware that it existed. You know, in the beginning, when you first are, 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 are I don't know, uh, in the presence of all that glory, you're like, you're really taken by it, and, and you just want to be around it continuously, and uh, you almost become, you, can't be, you become kind of like a Holy Spirit groupie, which is cool, which is cool. I totally get that. But, but again, if you're being unproductive, and you're just following around everybody and going from one semester seminar to another seminar so that you can sit in the audience and go, hallelujah, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, and go out in the spirit because they're waving their hands and saying, in the name of Jesus, and you're falling out and all that kind of stuff. But really where Jesus wants you to be is on the stage, you see, where Jesus wants you to be, not necessarily on the stage, but, you know, in the forefront of, perf- of the performance of the Great Commission, Okay, Jesus doesn't need more multitudes standing in the multitudes, if you know what I'm saying. Jesus needs more people getting out there and and, and waking other people up and touching their lives and changing their lives, whether that's by giving and helping and doing, you know, wonderful giving financial things or touching people's lives or reading the Bible to old people or or witnessing the people or, or whatever it is or laying your hands on them and binding and casting the demons out of them or starting a prayer vigil and and getting together with people on Skype or whatever the case may be and you know, whatever it is that the Lord is leading you to do, that's where the God wants us to be. Part of that calling, part of that activity, not a recipient of the activity, as much as a an, an active <clears throat> performer of the works that were laid before us, before the foundations of the earth, that were written in our books. So, uh, Psalm 139, verse uh, 16, that were written in our books before we were born. And uh, and that's where God and Jesus Christ, our King, wants us to ultimately be. The more of us that are out there, you know, kind of like doing stuff, right? Good, loving, kind, Jesus-y, Mark 16, 18, binding, casting out devils, uh, you know, setting up intercessory prayer, warrior groups, and all that kind of stuff, and prayer rooms, and all these things. You know, it's, it's a combination of the whole deal, right? Amen? But um, I've been on the phone. I was on the phone with uh, uh, with a, with a pastor that's traveling around with with a, another much more famous pastor uh, doing the divine healing thing, you know, from town to town to town and all that kind of stuff. And they ran across a an SRA DID victim, and it uh, stumped them. Yeah, but I already knew that that would be the case because of what, what what I went through. God made sure I went through what I went through so that, I, so, so that it became experiential. Because you can read all the books that you want to. You can bring all the guests and all the Douglas Riggs and, and uh, you know, all the Danny Duvalls that you want, and Preston Baileys and such on the show that you want to. But at the end of the day, all you're hearing is you're just sitting in the audience. You're just another you're just, just another testimony, and you have your wow moments. And oh my gosh, I can't really believe that's happening. But you're it's like watching a TV show. But when it happens to you, that changes everything. When you are having the flesh clawed off of your body by a strong man demon manifesting in an altar, with your finger bit half off and you're dialing 911 miraculously, I assure you, miraculously, and screaming into the phone in the middle of the night. When you wake up the next morning and you see an imprint of your head in the drywall with blood streaks coming down the drywall. (sighs) 
I never thought I was going to go through any of that. The Lord knew I was. <laughs> you know what? Now I go back and I listen to Bill Deagle's testimony, and I'm sitting there, and every single word he said was a fact. It is a fact. Now, I can't tell you uh, that uh, Hillary Clinton is a, you know, 10 to 16 foot tall draconian warrior demon thing. But, uh, oh, 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 line three, line three. This usually comes out of D.C. Who could it be? Oh, no. Shh, shh. Be quiet. Be quiet. Fox more Baxi Kaba. Edge. It's just wrong. Wrong. This is disturbing. We know who Hillary Clinton is. Pop Tarkonians. Ah, in the name of Jesus, I cast you all into the pit. Hallelujah. Praise God. <sighs> That's some creepy it's not weird. Normal. Wait, what? what? It's not normal. It's just wrong. Uh, what? It's not normal. This is disturbing. Hey, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, past is Perry. <sighs> some really weird stuff. Makes you want to go like this. <laughs> That just makes me want to dance, man. Let me tell you what. I just, you know, I'm turning the butter. Yeah, I wish I would be like, oh, whatever. That's impossible. I I don't know how that individual, (laughs) whatever. All right. Now, back to our book here, because we've got quite a ways to go through it, and hopefully Jesus comes back before we even get through it. UFOs, aliens, impregnated women, extraterrestrials, and God. Sex with reptilians, aliens, motherhood in the Bible. The Bible, the Bible, Abductions and Hybrids by Maximilian de Lafayette. Now, we just went through pretty much chapter one, believe it or not. <clears throat> and all these different um, entities uh, that they have cataloged, um, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, and I'm just kind of going over some of these. I'm looking at um, there's all kinds of ones. I don't remember even talking about some of these. I wonder if it's possible that we could have even skipped over some of these. I hope we didn't. Um, the uh, This is fascinating. Like here, it's mentioning the Nakim, or Nakim, which is um, part of the word uh, Anakim, which is associated with the word Anunnaki, putting it all together. It says also referred to as the Ls, or or the elder rays, or simply just as the giants. Referred to in the ancient Hebrew tradition, this race is allegedly tied in with ancient humans who broke off from mainstream humanity, land of Canaan, land of Canaan, land of Canaan, land of Canaan, because of their vast size, which had developed over the centuries. That's where it gets a little bit weird. Um, uh, Possibly as a result of a genetic anomaly. No kidding! Strange flesh, man. <laughs> Fallen angels can't have sex with human women. It's that three-strand DNA versus two-strand DNA. Pops out, you know, apparitions. <laughs> Twelve, and in some cases, much higher. And, and uh, you know, uh, oh boy, it is, it's amazing. And they have, uh, it goes on, it says that they're, they're, that they are allegedly been encountered in deep underground cavern systems all the way from Alaska down into uh, uh, Mexico. And are believed to have interstellar traveling capabilities, which is fascinating because when you go back and you listen to some of the other testimonies that I have on the uh, radio show console, um, uh, you you, um, you you know you have uh, folks that testify that they were taken you know people that you know whistleblowers and such that you know testify that they've been on spaceships, very very large ones. Uh, and that there were giant beings on them, on those uh, spaceships. So uh, very, 
fascinating. And it, it is, I find it most bizarre that what one of the things is they all seem to have in common is they they eat us. I mean, not just the reptilians, but the greys. They have to like, I don't know, do awful things and then turn our turn parts of us into like a porridge and <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to go into that. But anyway, it's a, uh, but you know, and the giants, it's, the Bible's not shy about saying, they eat us. <laughs> you know, Numbers 13, read it. Uh, oh, it's, oh, it's, it's just like, and there's been movies made about these things. Um, you know, they hint around about it in various movies. It's unbelievable. Um, uh, uh, let me see here. Um, have that uh, handy. I have a. Um, uh, I gotta recall the actual keywords to type into the console because I've got like hundreds of these sound bites. Um, let's see. The term was. Um, ah. It's on the tip of my tongue, uh, uh, but there was an old uh, uh, sci-fi movie from back in like the '60s. Um, uh, e- you know, e- 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 um, oh, that's what it is. I just think it, I just think it just hit me. Yeah, here it is. It's one minute and twenty-one seconds long, and the, it's just a short little title I gave it to serve man. But but check it out. Um, this is from a, a very old sci-fi picture. Listen to this. Flight number 914 from Earth to our planet. We will be taking off in three minutes. Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers, don't get on that ship. The rest of the book, to serve men, it's, it's a cookbook. <laughs> But anyway, as a little bit of a teaser, uh, since we're about to go into Chapter 3 of this uh, nefarious book, which has a lot of truth in it, by the way, which tracks directly back to the Bible, um, uh, uh, I'm going to read you the intro to Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is entitled... Alien Abduction, Physical Reality, and Science Face-to-Face. And it says, I'm just going to read you the bullet points. Are these UFO ultra-terrestrial and right here on Earth? Are these UFOs ultra-terrestrial and right here on Earth? Next one. Many reports of alien abductions even include power rods used to paralyze abductees, just as fairies wield magic wands. The next one. One of the most interesting comparisons between aliens and fairies is that both are interest, interested in stealing babies. Hmm. But you didn't know that about aliens. Most people don't. I do. Next one. Aliens abducting women, impregnating them, and later abducting them again. Now, that's pretty common knowledge. Well, you know, for some of us. The next one, many people report being tagged during frightening sessions on UFO operating tables. Hmm, must be talking about chips. Next one is alien abduction. Dr. John Mack, Carl Sagan, Bud Hopkins, and female abductees. The next one is John Mack ushers in a new era in UFOlogy. Next one is, abductees say that fevers and other illnesses sometimes disappear as a result of an abduction. Next one is, some women say their captors have taken them to nurseries where hybrid babies are being raised. 
That's actually quite common. Next one, Dr. Edward J. Uh, uh, Hansian or Kansian. I don't know what to make of it ultimately, and I'm basically somewhere between being a disbeliever and an agnostic. I suspect that one's just jam-packed with fascinating stuff. Listen to this. The abduction phenomenon could ultimately present mankind with a fourth blow to its collective ego. Hmm. I wonder if that correlates over to the concept of the fourth kind. The next one is the skeptic's position. The next one is abductions and rape, question mark. Next one is shared cultural delusions. Next one is how do they get sperm samples out of the male abductees? Next one is the aliens themselves don't typically wear clothes. Hmm. Don't typically. Sometimes they do. They do. And oftentimes the logos that they have on their uh, metallic uh, suits are, well, the same logo as the Trilateral Commission. Get it? <clears throat> Scientology? <laughs> it's all connected, folks. Mary Roach, the aliens have chosen instead to perform their exams using Earth kitchen equipment. <laughs> What's that? That sounds like Jonathan Clark. Uh, you're going to need a spatula to get your chin off the ground on this one. Next one is, men may be telepathically shown a picture of a naked female acquaintance to facilitate, ugh, I don't even want to go there, a UFO abduction, anthropology, and race fear. Hmm. Uh, let's see here. What else do we got? Oh, boy, this is a big list. Oh, I have to read a little bit faster. <clears throat> All right. Connections between UFO abduction panic and witch craze in Europe from the 15th to 18th century. Wow. Symbolic concerns over the coming of outsiders carrying off women and breeding with them. Another one. Uh, connection between the UFO phenomenon itself and, and race is curious and bizarre. Another one. Neo-Nazi groups are obsessed with the idea of extraterrestrial bloodlines in human groups. Hmm. Yes, non-white men are abductees too. Uh-oh. Alien abduction, reality facts, hypnosis in psychology face-to-face. The abduction phenomenon began in 1961 with the case of Betty and Barney Hill, which actually is not true. It's just when it, you know, started to bubble up into people's, you know, purview. Alien tests and procedures performed on them seem focused on reproductive, reproductive this and that. Why? Because of the hybridization program. Great tribulation. Control. All right, it goes on. Abductees come from all walks of life, age groups, and ethnic, ethnic backgrounds. Abductees exam, examined by psychologists are not diagnosed as being schizophrenic or delusional. Many therapists uh, attempt to explain abduction accounts as screen memories, masking the repression of other abuses. The theory of sleep paralysis is a common neuropathological uh, 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 explanation, but it is a poor argument, according to this uh, article. Most abductees remember some elements of abduction prior uh, of the abduction experience prior to hypnosis. Next one, bizarre explanations for the abduction phenomenon. Some abductees have small scars or scoop marks on their bodies. Some women abductees have suffered from a various, uh, various internal complications, including a high incidence of vo- ovarian cysts. Hmm. Does the alien abduction phenomenon represent some new form of psychiatric illness? Or is it possible that what abductees claim is happening to them is really true? Pres- uh, presentation of events which occurred during alien abductions. Ooh, cool. That'll be creepy. Visual uh, perceptions, paralysis, abductees are stripped, physical examinations, tools used, communication, post-abduction syndrome, and conclusions. Clinical discrepancies between expected and observed data in patients reporting UFO abductions, implications for treatment. The expressible response of most clinical and lay individuals upon hearing a UFO abduction account would be an immediate dismissal. How surprising. Kind of like 9-11, right? <laughs> Areas of discrepancy. Absence of major uh, psychop- uh, psych- psychopathology. Uh, I- individuals claiming alien uh, abduction frequently shows no evidence of past or present psychosis, delusional thinking, reality test- testing deficits, or hallucinations. 
Modicum or homo- homogeneity is uh, uh, in several respects. I don't know what that means. I'll have to look it up. Uh, the first uh, and most critical question is whether our subjects reported experiences could be accounted for strictly on the basis of uh, psychopathy or mental dis- mental disorders, and the affirmative answer is no. Concordance, uh, a concordance of reported data in the abduction scenarios. However, both specific details and themes repeat themselves with surprising regularity. Whether the individual has had previous contact with the literature literature of abduction seems to make little difference, of course. Uh, the abduction scenarios and hypotheses, uh, about 20% uh, of these highly concordant uh, abduction scenarios uh, are available spontaneously at the level of conscious awareness prior to hypnosis. Wow. Hopkins has classified patterns of, the, of abductions re, uh, abduction recall into five categories. Post-traumatic stress disorder, which I know a little bit about now, it took me to the age of 56 to actually experience that uh, in the absence of external trauma. Uh, summary and conclusions, absence of uh, uh, psychopathology, uh, concordance of reports, resistance and suggestion of uh, hypnosis, PTSD in the absence of trauma. Uh, it lies outside the realm of clinical expertise to determine with absolute certainty whether or not UFO abductions have indeed taken place. Well, <clears throat> my research indicates that it's not only are they taking place, <laughs> but it's far, far darker than the Hall of Horrors and Dulcie even begins to touch upon. At one point in my research, I had as close of as, as as a nervous breakdown as you could possibly. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. I was so traumatized that as I got up from my research desk at almost two o'clock in the morning and walked out of the room, I literally fell to the ground on my knees and started to bawl hysterically dead, these entities, and God will cast them all into a lake of fire. The agony that they will feel for what they have inflicted upon man, mankind is beyond our wildest comprehension. And they deserve every bit of it. That's why we spend all of our time praying for the lost. That God can have mercy on their souls as he has on ours. Praise his holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And on that note, let's go ahead and see if, see if we can bring on Brother Lauren Peterson. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here we go. Opinions of our guests are not necessarily those of Tribulation Now. TribulationNow.org, TribulationNow.net, TribulationNow.com, Facebook.com, forward slash Tribulation Now. Or for that matter, ah, heck, they may not be anyone else's opinions. What? So, be a good Berean, Acts 1711, and search the scriptures daily to see if it is so. May God bless you. Exactly. Exactly. Um, here, wait, wait. Here we go. Your mothers will never buy pop tarts again without thinking of us. 
<laughs> I like pop tarts, especially the brown sugar cinnamon ones. They're like my favorite. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yipper, skipper. Wow. <clears throat> a lot to think about this morning. <laughs> Man, you yeah. got my head spinning. <laughs> I got to get a yeah. grip. I know, right? It's it's all about, uh, you know, this. <laughs> And then you're like, oh, my gosh, when God sends a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie, you know, that's like a euphemism. <laughs> He's really yeah. toning it down. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, first up is the, I remember watching that episode you referred to. It's To Serve Man. It's Twilight Zone, episode 89. I looked it up. It's on Wikipedia. Episode 89, Twilight Zone. So I remember watching that, and that's quite a, you know, the play on words and play on realities. I, I like how they they spun that show at the very end there. And uh, <clears throat> so it that show, uh, you know, play, playing on words, playing on realities, it, it uh, exemplifies so much of what we uh, every day take for granted. We just assume things, okay? We just assume things, take things for granted uh, as realities or that's just the way it is without looking past the facade behind the curtain <laughs> to check it out. To, is it really that way? You know, what What does to serve man really mean, okay? Uh, well, it may mean different things to different people, different beings, okay? So in this case, <laughs> they were as a cookbook <laughs> to cook up mankind, right? Um, <clears throat> but we take a lot of things for granted, and it's just, uh, you know, our lives are busy, and we just, in order to get through the day, we assume things, right? So, like, okay, if you're super paranoid, you don't know if you, when you turn that uh, switch on in your car, if it's going to blow up on you, so you better go out there with, a, <laughs> you know, one of those mirrors to look underneath the car to check for bombs, you know, and have electronic sniffers, you know, and everything. I mean, just go through all the whole nine yards of checking your car out before you even turn it on because you never know, okay? <laughs> you never know if you want to get super paranoid, okay? All kinds of things, right? So we, we don't have the luxury of getting super paranoid about every single thing to check every single thing out over and over and over again. That would be like the definition of insanity, right? <clears throat> so we assume things. To get through the day, we assume things. Okay? Uh, but then it becomes a habit. And so then just to get through another day, we assume that what we're hearing on the news, you know, the 5 o'clock, 5, 30, 6 o'clock news is the truth. Never digging any deeper because we're, we've are we been working all day. We're tired. Our brains are frazzled. Our bodies are shot. We don't just don't have the energy to dig any deeper. So we just assume that what we've been told is the truth. And so we're led down the proverbial, you know, um, <clears throat> path to destruction um, in so many ways and and uh, boy you know I John just said this morning he's been through the last couple of weeks through the the blender effect you know just shredding him losing that data okay and and the pressures incredible pressures when you're on the spot and you got to deliver and you can't deliver because your computer just crapped out okay well, you know, I know what that's like, too, you know, losing files. I try to be c computing safe, you know, and everything, but there's just times when things just crap out on you. So this past week, I have this uh, nice big, I don't know how big it was, uh, but a big, nice LCD uh, screen TV in the living room, right? And just out of the blue, that morning it worked fine, you know. And when I came back uh, from work in the evening to watch the news, um <clears throat> Yeah, you know, the remote didn't appear to not work. So I say, well, maybe the batteries are shot, you know. So I swapped batteries, and it still didn't turn on. So I even swapped out another pair of batteries, and I'm standing right in front of the TV with the remote, and it still doesn't turn on. So then I even physically press the on-off button, and it still doesn't come on. 
it's so it's like John's uh, computer just bit the dust out of the blue, and so my TV bit the dust out of the blue, just out of the blue, just without warning, just gave up the ghost. Okay, and that's it. So for the last few days, I've been without a TV. And it's really strange, you know, because we're so used to, we're in that habit, even just watching the weather report, what's coming up tomorrow, you know, tonight, tomorrow, the week. We're so used to that. <clears throat> and so when it's not there, it's like, you know, okay, for the first few hours, first day, you know, you can get through, but, you know, you kind of go through withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> okay. But then picture living in the 1800s. There's no TV, nobody even conceived the TVs back then. Okay, so um, think of what it's going to be like in our immediate future when the lights are turned out and there's no TVs anywhere that work. None. Zippo. Or if they do, if there's any that do, the only thing you can get on them is government-approved propaganda. <laughs> okay? And because of our busy lives and assuming everything is that we're told is true, we're going to believe the government propaganda except for those of us who have been awakened to the true agenda on this planet, okay? And we're not going to buy into that crap. Okay, so it's kind of strange. So i got a lot of books to read, (laughs) a lot of books to read, a lot of things to do other than watching the boob tube, right? So that's what I've been trying to busy myself. I can't justify going out and spend several hundred dollars on a new TV. That's just not what I'm going to do, okay? Money's tight. i got to... You know, spearhead what dollars I have towards those things that are more important than buying a new TV. So if I can find like a freebie someplace or, you know, somebody at a rummage sale has got a a small TV, then I'll pick one up. But I'm not spending my hard-earned money for the luxury of a big screen TV, you know. Smart, especially a smart TV. I don't want one of them anywhere near me. Um, <clears throat> period. Okay, so we get into all these assumptions and just to get through another day and et cetera. So it's kind of difficult. To, you know, I understand it. John understands it. A lot of us understand it. It's difficult to unplug from the matrix and to question what's behind the curtain and even to try to delve, to pull the curtain back and examine what's behind there. It takes time. It takes effort. You have to rise above the occasion and dig in your heels to become like laser focused, determined to discover the truth about things. And again, this plays over into our churches. Okay, so we go to church to be a good Christian, we go to church every Sunday or Saturday, whatever your flavor is, you know, your persuasion. And Wednesday nights and, you know, Bible studies and youth groups and all this stuff, saturated with going to church and stuff. But we're going through the motions. Again, we're making assumptions that we're, what the preacher's preaching up there, or what the Bible study leader is talking about and you know, the Bible is true. And and uh, don't bring it into question, okay? Or if you do bring it into question, you're automatically branded a heretic, you know, because <laughs> you don't know anything and they know everything, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so we assume things, and so we don't typically would ever imagine that that preacher up there might be, just might be, a shape-shifting reptilian, okay? That can quote the Bible just as well as anybody else can. But with a little slight here and a little slight there, okay, it sure sounds like the Word of God, but there's a little nuance here, a little nuance there that taken together, if you can kind of step back at a fair enough distance to get a perspective, you can see that all those little nuances lead to a different conclusion, (laughs) okay, that leads to destruction. So you're not going to be able to see that unless you can, like, disconnect from that reality, from that matrixed reality, and step back and take a more observant uh, view, role of things, and certainly ask for discernment from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit, okay, to to get the lowdown on what's going on. 
So a lot of our churches are compromised, folks, even though they're preaching and teaching the Word of God, but it is it the full Word of God, okay? Or do they have a secret agenda behind the scenes leading to wrongful conclusions? So I would fairly say that just about every church, not all of them, but so many churches are compromised in one way or the other. And so God is calling his people out of these churches to be his living church. Okay, I hope that makes sense to people. Because when when the time comes, folks, we see in various countries of the world today, like take China, for example, they're going through the entire countryside and they're burning or tearing down churches or converting them into communist centers of education or whatever the case may be. They're actively persecuting Christians over there. Uh, either switch to communism, uh, you know, swear your allegiance to the state, you know, or if you insist on being a Christian, we're going to put the screws to you, even death. So a lot of Christians are being horribly persecuted over there, and we see other nations in the world that are horribly persecuting Christians. And so that will come to the United States. That reality will come here, where churches will be shuttered here en masse, and the flocks will be scattered to the four winds. Now, you either convert to your allegiance to making America great again, or we're going to persecute you and take you down and kill you. Okay? So, <clears throat> it's make America great again can go can cut both ways, folks. For those of us who remember what America used to be, we would like to tie we would like to tie into the upside the upshot of making America great again, but there's a downside that they're not telling you about. So what if it swings to the extreme that you either swear your allegiance to making America great again or we're gonna persecute you? So we would say, Yay, go after those traitors within the American government. Okay, great. But will it stop there, or will it continue to other groups, other peoples, that do want to see America great again, but not at the expense of denying Christ in their lives? Okay. So we see the, like Google, for example, they, they've already you know uh, given themselves over to the Chinese way of doing things over there, you know. So that. Compu- those computer programs already exist, so it's just a simple implementation over here in America to do the same thing. So you have a social credit score, so if your social credit score doesn't line up with what the powers that be think it should be, then you can be denied a job, denied an apartment, a house, credit, you can't buy nothing, can't sell nothing, you're a nobody. Good luck living under a bridge or out in the forest, okay? Okay. <laughs> In our modern day of, you know, buying food and groceries at the grocery store and gas and all that business, you know, I like to be a prepper, but I'm under under no illusion of my ability to survive out in the wild. I'll probably starve to death (laughs) unless the angels of God bring me food to eat. I'm going to starve to death. Okay, I'm under no illusion. I'm a product of modern day life and lifestyle and technologies. Okay, so we have these assumptions, and many of the churches are leading us down the same pathway to destruction, but ju- but under the cloak of Christianity. Okay, so what's behind the veil? <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> um, I want to read just one uh, from uh, Glenda Lomax from this past week, Wings of Prophecy, September 24th. Just read one, but there's a number of them. So I encourage you to go to her website, Wings of Prophecy, and read this past week's words from the Lord, from Jesus, that she has received, because they're all very pertinent, always pertinent. <clears throat> I also encourage you that Sister Julie from uh, Behold I Come has uh, also a current word from Jesus, okay, and it has some definite tie-ins to what we study here on this program. I won't read it this time. It's a long read, and there's a lot of... Uh, meat and potatoes in, in that one that we can tie into. So I'll save that for a later time to uh, to tie into that one. But for now, I'll read uh, Glinda's. 
uh, one here on September 24th, Prepare America. America has chosen darkness over light. Now I'm going to break away here. Okay, maybe you and me as an individual have chosen light over darkness. But as a nation, America has chosen darkness over light. Okay, I'll continue. She has chosen her ways over mine. She has chosen sin over righteousness. Yea, even great sin. She clings to her abominations and promotes them to other nations. Her defiance of me, the one who made her great, is a stench in my nostrils. Okay, because America has chosen darkness over light, I will give her over to darkness. I will call forth her enemies to turn out the lights in America. And America will be cloaked in darkness for all to see. I called you to repentance, America, but you would not. Your haughty spirit has now spread to other nations, and your abominations have overflowed your borders and defiled others. I will give you over to the evil and perversion you have chosen over me, and it will be your destruction. Since you have not chosen what is right, but you have chosen evil over good, evil will fill your borders. Your enemies will trample you underfoot. They will take your women and kill your children. They will spare none, young or old. They will defile your land as they go, eating your crops and ruining your flocks. Famine will abound and the people of America will be turned into the streets as their homes will no longer be safe havens. Prepare, America, for I am calling forth your enemies to destroy you. No longer will you be called beautiful or free, for I will give you over to them and none of the wicked shall be able to stand against me, the Holy One of Israel. As you have shown no mercy to others, no mercy shall be shown to you. As you have allowed those within your borders to slaughter the innocent, so shall your beauty be slaughtered, and you will not rise again. Long has the innocent blood of those you killed cried out to me, but I am long-suffering, giving you much time to repent. Yet you have not repented. You are haughty and scornful, wicked and perverse, and I will abide you no longer. There's your end game of making America great again, folks. Just as King Saul came upon the company of prophets, he was in the process of hunting down David. And King Saul came across this company of prophets, and the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he began to prophesy along with the prophets. So he misconstrued this to be as God's endorsement of his hunting down David, when in fact was God's last call to him unto repentance. Through President Trump's Make America Great Again efforts, America has been given one last opportunity unto repentance. This is America's last call unto repentance. But is America going the way of Saul, King Saul? Yes, unfortunately. What Jesus has just revealed in this statement, in this, um, this whole statement here, Prepare America, is that America has crossed the Rubicon, has crossed over to the point of no return. But this is it, folks. This is it. So if you happen to be benefiting from making America great again, you know, maybe you've landed a job that you've been out of for a while, or maybe you've You've had a job for a while, but now you're getting those pay increases and those perks and everything. Do not take that for granted. God's last mercy unto this nation before the bottom drops out. Use this time to prepare because there will be no time once the bottom drops out. Italy right now is going through economic turmoil. It's about ready to fall apart. Okay? And we see like the... uh, uh, nations in South 
America that are hitting the skids in their economies and people are going hungry and starving and killing dogs and cats just to eat and even each other just to eat. That is coming to America, folks. What we see going around in other places of the world, that, and we can even see some of that already having taken root in America, but it's going to get far, far worse because God is going to give America completely over to the darkness that it has chosen. Okay. So it's going to get far worse. Now is the time to prepare our hearts, our minds. Study God's word like there's no tomorrow. Pray for the lost because once this happens, there'll be probably no time to pray for the lost. Pray now while you have time for the lost that they may be found. Pray now for the foolish virgins that they may become wise because when this happens, there'll be no time to pray for anything or anybody. Okay, when 9-11 hit, I was numb for a week. I couldn't pray. I couldn't study the, the Bible, couldn't read it. I was numb for a week. When this next time happens, it'll be like 10 to 100 9-11s coming down at once. Just imagine what the shell shock is going to be. People will be walking in the streets totally like, hello, anybody home? You know, They'll be so shell-shocked out of their minds of what, what will happen that there'll be no comprehension. <clears throat> It'll be like they're totally drugged out of their minds. They just won't be able to connect with anything or anybody. Okay, It'll be too late to pray for those people unless, unless you're one of the chosen ones. And you can literally walk up to them and lay hands on them and cast the demons out and, and retrieve them right there. But but if you happen to be numbed by what's coming up and you're basically like offline for a while, you're not going to be of any use during that time because you're, you yourself and myself are going to be trying to recover from the, what reality has just delivered, you know, <clears throat> of being handed over to our enemies. And, you know, you're sitting in South Dakota, New York City, right? 9-11, okay, so that's far away, so that's, you know. But what happens if something like that happens here where I live or where you live, okay? What's the response going to be? How are we going to deal with that? No TVs, no electricity, no radios, no nothing, no cars don't work, you know. <laughs> Everything's, we're thrown back in the 1800s. Are you going to make it? Am I going to make it? I have no idea. Outside of God's provision, no, I'm not going to make it. Okay. All right. Now I want to swing back <clears throat> into something I've been uh, kind of working on the back burner for a while. Okay. So this, I'm going back here to, um, it's a simple article, but it has a lot of repercussions. And this, the title is called Sweeping Gene Survey Reveals New Facets of Evolution. It's dated May 28, 2018, by Marlo Hood, and this is uh, on phys, P-H-Y-S dot org slash news. Okay, so that's where it was posted. <clears throat> and so I'm going to read some snippets from Marlo's writings here. And here it goes. Mark Stokel from the Rock, uh, Rockefeller University in New York and David Thaler at the University of uh, Basel in Switzerland, who together published findings last week, that be last week of May 28th, okay, to uh, sure to jostle, if not overturn, more than one settled idea about how evolution unfolds. It is textbook biology, for example, that species with large, far-fung populations, think ants, rats, humans, will become more genetically diverse over time. You know, over time, thinking, you know, like hundreds of thousands of years, millions and millions of years, and then it goes on here. Okay, but is this true? Is that true? <clears throat> Stokel says the answer is no. He's a lead author of the study published in the journal Human Evolution. For the planet's 7.6 billion people, 500 million house sparrows, or 100,000 sandpipers, genetic diversity is about the same, quote-unquote, is about the same, he told AFP. The study's most startling result, perhaps, is that 9 out of 10 species on Earth today, including humans, came into being 
Uh, this is what maybe the controversial part, 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. <clears throat> Quoting, this conclusion is very surprising, and I fought against it as hard as I could, Sailor told AFP. Now, Sailor is a hard-nosed evolutionist, and he's saying this conclusion is very surprising, and I fought against it as hard as I could. <clears throat> Continuing, that reaction is understandable. How does one explain the fact that 90% of animal life, genetically speaking, is roughly the same age? Was there some catastrophic event 200,000 years ago that nearly wiped out the slate clean? Then uh, skipping over some paragraphs, continuing. In analyzing the barcodes across 100,000 species, the researchers found a telltale sign showing that almost all the animals emerged about the same time as humans. Continuing through some paragraphs, quoting again, but the last true mass extinction event was 65.5 million years ago when a likely asteroid strike wiped out land-bound dinosaurs and half of all species on Earth. Continuing through some paragraphs, quoting again, and yet another unexpected finding from the study, species have very clear genetic boundaries, and there's nothing much in between. Now, that's very interesting. A lot of interesting tidbits here. There's a lot mentioned here once you tap into some of these things. So take, for example, this last uh, sentence I quoted. Um that the, the one of the unexpected findings from the study, species have very clear genetic boundaries and there's nothing much in between. One of the very foundations of evolution is that one species can evolve into another species. I mean, you know, man evolved, you know, the great soup ponds, genetic soup ponds, primordial soup, you know, and created this and that, evolved this and evolved that, and then we get to the great apes, and from the great apes came the proto-humans, and then humans, and human, eventually humans, <laughs> you know, human beings and everything, we evolved from the great apes, that kind of business, the theory of evolution. <clears throat> But this study is proving that that theory is wrong, as we have clearly known that from the, what the Bible says. Clear genetic boundaries, and there's nothing much in between. In other words, a horse is a horse, of course. And it always has been, always will be. Okay? A horse is a horse, of course. Okay, so what the Bible says in the creation account is like producing like. Now, within that like-producing like, there's genetic variance, but it st stays within that genetic boundary. Okay? So take dogs, for example. Is there only one kind of dog on the planet? No, there's all kinds of flavors and you know, shapes, sizes, and colors of dogs from A to Z, right? So there's a lot of genetic diversity, but it's still within the genetic boundary of dog. The dog doesn't somehow, billions of years from now, turn into a cat, into a horse, into a cow, into a salamander, into a human being, that kind of business. Clear genetic boundaries. But within that boundary, there's a lot of genetic variance within that boundary, if you kind of get what I'm saying here. okay? So that theory of evolution, that one species can blend or morph or evolve into another, is being proven wrong right here. And that then ties right back into what the Bible says, what, how God set things up, like producing like. Okay, And then um, the last mass extinction event was 65.5 million years ago. Okay, So when we look through the lens of the angel wars, perhaps that was, you know, that could have been part of the angel wars, wiping out the dinosaurs. Uh, what happened to this planet? Who knows um, exactly, okay? Now, this getting back to this 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, 9 out of 10 species on Earth today, okay? 9 out of 10. That means 1 out of 10 pre-existed this 9 out of 10. This 1 out of 10 was the base group from which all others have come forth from. So something happened 100 to 200,000 years ago that nearly wiped everything off the planet, except for that 10% that survived. And out of that 10% comes forth 
nine others, nine other species, nine out of ten species came into being back then, okay? So that 10% was the core group that survived the catastrophe. So let's take a look, okay? Let's take a look what some possibilities. This is not a thus saith the Lord session here. Yes, we're looking at what possibilities could be through a biblical lens, okay? So I, I'm going to be reading some of my writings here, uh, notes and things that I put together for this, and it might blend into uh, next next show too because there's a lot of material here. What, basically, in order to interpret this 100,000, 200,000 years ago, we have to have some kind of a grip understanding of what happened and kind of when it happened. And I'm not going to get into whether it's a billion years or 100,000 years. We're going to look at what happened in sequence of events. And if we want to slap a time frame on it, that's a different matter. But a sequence of events, what happened first, what happened second, what happened. Okay, we have to get beyond the theory that God created everything to everyone 6,000 years ago. And that the young, that's the young earth theory. And that the earth is a young earth created to look old. Okay, in light of all the evidence, it just would, to me personally and to John, it just, it's just totally preposterous that God created everything and everyone, you know, everything that exists 6,000 years ago with the appearance of age. Okay, so, you know, Adam and Eve supposedly, you know, were created at 4004 B.C., okay, supposedly. I don't believe that for a second anymore. I used to when I was younger. I don't believe it anymore for several decades now. Don't believe that. But... <clears throat> Uh, because it was determined by this guy named Usher, you know, hundreds of years ago. Usher, this guy who went through the lineages and calculated, okay, Adam and Eve, 4004 B.C. Well, what if all the lineages have not been included in the lineage chart? And so we're missing out on thousands of years of human history that have not been recorded through the lineages. Okay. <clears throat> now, um just like you can build a new house with new wiring and plumbing and new two-by studs inside the walls, etc., but use older vintage materials for all visible areas, such as windows and doors and trim boards, floor boards, outside, clapboards, siding, etc., to get a real antique house effect. If God created the earth and all of creation to look old 6,000 years ago, then even those elements that look old are young. Whereas in our fallen realm, a new house built to look like an old house, if using all new materials, will still have the ambiance of a new house with all new materials. Even though it's built to look old, it's going to have that look and feel of still being new. So to achieve a real antique house effect, true older materials must be used for all visible areas. The realm of this fallen one-third that we are have been sandboxed in should show evidences of its original created status prior to the rebellion and war and being sandboxed, evidences of the war, and evidences of God's restoration process. So when the scientists are looking, whether in the microscope or the telescope, and they're trying to interpret what they see, what they find through their instruments and everything, but do they have this perspective that we're living in a sandboxed reality here that's been cut off from the unfallen two-thirds? And so when they look through these things and their evidences, do they have any notion of this rebellion in the war, um, you know, of the original creation? Do they have any uh, awareness that there was a rebellion in war and that we've been sandboxed and that – but there's – also, evidences of God's restoration process, the six days of creation are literally the six days of restoration. If we can wrap our mind around that, that verse 1 in Genesis chapter 1 is the original creation. When we get to verse 2, it's showing us the consequence of the angel wars, Luciferian rebellion and angel wars fought in the heavens and as pertains to our own solar system and in particular to this planet we call Earth, our home planet. This planet Earth. That's what verse 2 is. It's reflecting the consequence of that war and then the turning point into the six days of restoration, what God did about it. On day one, he said, let there be light. 
Instead of let there be light, he could have said let there be final judgment, and that would have been the end of things. But it's because he's not willing that any should perish. And why is that? Because of his great love for all creation that he originally created, even those that rebelled and warred against him. He still loved them fervently to the point where he's going to offer them an opportunity unto redemption and repentance. Now, some groups are so off the charts evil and vile that he locked them away, put them in a prison, okay? But some groups, you know, various judgments, because God is just. It's not a one-size-fits-all judgment. He looks at the individual soul, okay, weighs each soul in the balance to determine what to do, okay? And some groups are just so off the charts, evil and vile, that uh, he locked them away. And some groups he allowed to come forth to uh, to experience the possible redemption and salvation, okay? Now, <clears throat> Continuing on, so if we can at least grasp that, that we're within this fallen one-third, that's what the six days of restoration about is about the fallen one-third. And when we get to the seventh day, which is the day of rest, where God rested from his labors, right? If we now can grasp that he's resting from his labors of restoration, not of creation, okay? So in the unfallen two-thirds, do you think God is just sitting on his duff? doing nothing, okay? I can't picture that. I mean, God is infinitely creative, right? Do you think he's just going to sit on his stuff for a few eons of time and just kick back and take it easy, take a vacation, leave the farm for a while, you know, like we would? No. I picture him, our Heavenly Father, our Abba Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, our elder, little elder brother, as continuing. I mean, they, they are the eternal creationists. You know, I just feel like a like they have a fire in their belly to continue creating new and wondrous things within that unfallen two thirds. So picture the original unfallen two thirds, how it was at that point, and then picture God, you know, the Godhead, continuing on within the unfallen two thirds in creating even more grander creations that will be in store for those of us who have received Jesus Christ and continued in Jesus Christ to the end. Because even he's, you know, he who endureth to the end shall be saved. You have to finish the race. You can't just enter the race and then quit. You got to finish and cross the finish line. But just think of the wonders that he has in store for those who finish the finish across the finish line. Okay? The wonders that he's continued to create wonderful things. Okay? And so but this fallen one third has been sandboxed and it has not been expanded. Okay? It has not. It cannot. God would not allow this evil to expand any further. So it's limited by the sandbox effect. Okay, <clears throat> so if we can get a grip on that, what the seventh day really means, that he rested from his labors of this restoration of this fallen one-third, but in the unfallen two-thirds, he continues. Do you think for a moment that the Holy Spirit, even if God the Father took a break, do you think the Holy Spirit took a break ever? Ever took a break? I mean, it would all fall apart. All of creation would fall apart. <laughs> okay, if the Holy Spirit was not continuously active in all of creation. So this notion that, you know, the, the point of the seventh day for us was that we would remember God and honor God on the seventh day. That we would cease from our own self-interest and our own jobs and things like that and focus on why we're really here and to fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. And, you know, it's really hard. If you go to church with somebody and then you go to work with the same person, it's kind of difficult, you know. You, you develop attitudes and, oh, I hate my boss, I hate my coworkers. Then you're sitting right next to them in the pew at church and praising Jesus, you know. That doesn't work out too well, does it? So, I mean, you're you're facing that person that you detest. So how do you reconcile that, see? So... <clears throat> If we really are following that seventh day example, you know, but because our culture is so verse and so compartmentalized, you can go to work, but the same people you see at work are not the same people you go to church with. So you you go to work and you can, you know, those feelings of animosity and hatreds and bigotries and racisms and everything can flare up 
over and over and over again, six days a week. Then you go to church and you're with a different bunch that you can just unwind, you know. But what if the same people, you had to work and had to worship with the same group of people? It would force us to find a way of reconciliation, to come into peaceful terms, okay? So <clears throat> the seventh day was for this fallen one-third to focus on the things of God and to worship God and to study, read his word, and to treat one another in loving kindness instead of at each other's throat the other six days of the week kind of thing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> continuing on, this new finding of 90% of all DNA on the planet is derived from a core 10% that survived a near extinction event. So there's some possibilities, biblically speaking, of what this might have been, when. Would this have been Lucifer's flood? Lucifer's flood is typically referred to as the um, Genesis 1, verse 2, um, <clears throat> as uh, one of the consequences of Lucifer and rebellion war in the heavens was called Lucifer's flood on this planet because the planet, Earth, had become a watery graveyard. Or what was is this referring to Noah's flood? We know that Noah's flood. Now some people believe that Noah's flood was just a regional event. But uh, if you happen to believe that Noah was uh, um, highly intelligent, you know, highly intelligent, highly capable person, and he's he was in tune with God, do you think God would have? Hey, Noah, I want you to build an ark, put all these animals on there, and and uh, ride out the great flood. But it was only a regional flood, and, and uh, so everybody else on the planet survived. Everybody else, you know, all the um, giants and Nephilims and all the um, genetically altered plant and animal life, that, all that other stuff survived. But just in this region, it all got wiped out, and that's why God had Noah build an ark. I mean, come on, folks. Logic 101, you got 120 years to prepare for a flood, right? Are you going to build an ark or are you going to pack your bags and leave the area? Logically, you're going to pack your bags and leave the area. Just get out of harm's way. It's simple. What would you do? <laughs> you know, you you can build an ark, you know. Uh, let's say, you know, uh, out here we got this Lake Pactola. So if God would reveal to me that, uh, you know, 10 years from now it's going to blow out and it's going to flood this whole area. So i got 10 years to prepare. So it's got to have me build a boat and ride out, you know. Uh, ride out a dangerous flood or just pack my bag, sell everything I got, get in the car and leave. I think the simple solution is just, you know, sell everything you got, pack your bags, get in the car and leave. Okay. Or get on a camel, get on a horse, get on a, a donkey, whatever, walk. Okay. Just get out of harm's way. You know, 101 here, folks. No, to me, Noah's flood was global because this infestation of the serpent creatures, and the Nephilim, you know, the Watchers and stuff, was global in scope. And so it had to be dealt with globally. Those Nephilim creatures and those serpent creatures weren't just in one region of the planet. They were all over the place. And now we're going to examine how that might have come to be. Okay? So I don't think that this 10% that survived was Noah's flood, and I go on to explain why. I think the most likely possibility is the Tower of Babel. And I'm going to be getting into this, and it's going to turn into the next episode show here to get into this. But I'll continue here. Lucifer's flood, Genesis 1-2, and the earth had become without form and made void. Now, I've mentioned this many times before in recent uh, shows here. Void of life, made void, as void of life and formless, unrecognizable, ravaged so bad that if you didn't know it was the earth, you wouldn't know what planet it was, or even if it was a planet. That's how bad this planet had become. As one of the many outcomes of the Luciferian rebellion and ancient wars throughout the fallen one-third of creation, the earth was rendered a watery graveyard unrecognizable as the earth, even perhaps unrecognizable as a planet. So it could be assumed that if the earth was made void, void of all life, with DNA, of, you know, the life that was here before that, the DNA is shredded. The, sh the blender effect is shredded to pieces. Then there would not even be a core 10% to survive to rebuild life on the earth. planet was made void, void of all life, 
It was a graveyard. Nothing survived here. That's what that second verse is telling me. Okay. Without form and made void. <clears throat> Previously to this, it had a form and was full of plant and animal and highly intelligent life forms. What a devastation, huh? So during the sixth day ages of restoration, God then literally rebuilt new life forms from previously existing DNA building blocks. And if anybody um, listened to uh, uh, Tribulation Dash Now this past Sunday <clears throat> with uh, Elena Matthews, just look at um, John's archives there. It's, uh, this, just this past Sunday, he had a guest uh, Elena Matthews, who basically said the same thing, that DNA is like Legos, building blocks, okay? That's what it is. You can build anything. If you've got the building blocks, you can build anything you want with them, okay? So God is uh, taking these previously existing DNA bu building blocks that had been shredded to pieces during the war and the watery graveyard effect, the blender effect. But God also introduced, so he's building new life forms from these existing building blocks, but he's also introducing new life forms originating from outside the sandbox fallen one-third. From within the unfallen two-thirds, perhaps if one in one specific specific case, even directly from the throne room itself. Now the fallen angels, nor fallen Lucifer himself, also being sandbox within this fallen one third of creation. Okay, now I'm going to say say something, then we're going to look at scripture. Okay, <clears throat> could ever have any possible ability to reach into, to travel into the unfallen two thirds, and certainly not into the throne room, and bring back into the fallen realm those beings that were untainted by the rebellion and war. These specific beings are referenced by the Hebrew word bara, B-A-R-A. -A. Look it up yourselves to determine just which life forms were made and which were created via bara. <clears throat> now, turning to Scripture, um, we, go, we turn to Job chapter 1. Verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Okay, so this right here would clearly indicate that Lucifer still had, the, now as Satan, still had the ability to cross the threshold, that DMZ zone, right, the separation, that sandbox separation to, trans, to travel from the fallen one-third into the unfallen two-thirds before the Lord. <clears throat> now, keep in mind <clears throat> that Satan, when he was Lucifer, he was the high priest of the nine stone covenant that's clearly uh, referenced in Ezekiel 28, verse 13, okay, and other verses within the 12 to 19 stretch. <clears throat> that he was the high priest of the nine, so he had a direct audience with the Most High, with the Godhead. He became a mere image of the Godhead, so that's why even today he can portray himself as God the Father. For those who want to believe that God is only the Father and there's no Son, no Holy Spirit, okay, he can portray that. <clears throat> or if you want to believe uh, in Jesus, but you're not really anchored, okay, he can portray himself as Jesus. And he can portray himself as the Holy Spirit, okay? Because he was there, he absorbed it all. And he's a mere reflection. So he's reflecting that back, but now it's a corrupted. It's that little bit of leaven here, a little nuance there, a little change there, you know, that kind of thing <clears throat> that can lead us off, you know, off stray, lead us to our own destruction. Now here he's appearing among the, the angels, the sons of God, and he's appearing. So he d still has access to doing this. Okay, and the Lord said to Satan, from where you come you? Where, where are you coming from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. <clears throat> okay, so 
is clearly making reference to the earth. But I would uh, venture to say this also includes the, the fallen one third that he can, uh, tran- you know, travel here and there within the fallen one third. But in this particular instance, he's coming from planet Earth and crossing the DMZ zone into the unfallen two thirds and going before the Lord with the other sons of God. Now, when the uh, when the fallen one third was not yet fallen, it was still perfect. And Satan, in his position as Lucifer before he fell, he traveled into this these areas that comprise the fallen one third. He traveled here in his role as high priest of the Nine Stone Covenant. He traveled within this fallen one third region, bringing forth the latest word of God and provision and wisdom and knowledge, all all the goodness from the throne room. He's bringing it forth. Okay, so he. The temples, you find temples all over the place. In other planets, you'll find temples, right? Temples to the gods. But I have a suspicion, suspicion again, reading Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19, it mentions about sanctuary, that he polluted his sanctuary. So what if that word sanctuary can also mean temple, that Lucifer and the angels had uh, built temples as stargate Stargate type of things, so they can just zip here, zip there, zip everywhere, and they they go into the temple, <clears throat> and that's the temple called the temple of God. But it's where Lucifer would would come, zip here, zip there, to to present himself before the peoples of those respective planets to bring forth the latest word from God, and then to take back prayers and petitions and praises back to the throne room. Okay, that was his role, high priest. That's what he did. Day in, day out, <clears throat> all over, all over creation. So now he's presenting himself again. So, okay, when President Trump became when Pr- Mr. Trump became President Trump, we know that he stripped was it Brennan? Brennan he has somewhat recently stripped Brennan of his security clearances, right? So Brennan can't have security access into certain aspects of the government. But I suspect because Mr. Brennan has a lot of deep, you know, deep state uh, contacts everywhere, right? Well, so what? He can get his information he wants from other avenues, if you know what I mean, right? So even though he's been directly cut off, he's not been totally cut off. Well, okay, so it took a while for President Trump to to come to that point of cutting Brennan off, but Brennan still can gain access, right? So it's not a total cutoff. So picture that with Lucifer. Lucifer rebelled, war in the heavens, sandboxed, okay? But Lucifer's security clearance to cross over that divide and enter in amongst the other unfallen sons of God to present themselves before the one true God, right? Lucifer still had his security clearance to do that. Now, I suspect, though, when Jesus went to the cross and went into the bowels of Sheol for three days, three nights, and came back up, Lucifer was stripped of all his security clearances, even back door. He's been totally cut off. That was his That was his and the fallen realm's final call unto repentance. So when Jesus descended in the bowels of Sheol, in my opinion, that was the last call unto repentance, even under Lucifer and his gang, last call. And what did they do? Did they repent? No. They jeered at him. They made fun of him. They catcalled him. You know, the uh, <clears throat> mockers and smockers and abusers, they just even turned up, turned it all up even more so because they thought they had Jesus right where they wanted him. Okay, but guess what, folks? <laughs> Imagine their embarrassment. Three days and three nights, and and that's in our reality, right? In our space-time reality. <clears throat> Imagine in the realm of eternal time, right? Imagine their embarrassment. Imagine their feelings of defeat and misery, and turning against each other. You see, when we have a common enemy to fight and we kind of lay down our personal differences and focus on the common cause of fighting a common enemy, right? But when that common enemy is defeated, then we re- return to our own personal vendettas against one another. We can 
return back to backstabbing and rumor mongering and and uh, you know tripping people up and pulling the rug out from under them and laughing at them and all that business. Right? Picture that happening here. That all of hell, you know, the fallen one third, Lucifer and his gang are all united in cat calling and jeering Jesus because he's right where they want him, right? And then when he rises up again from the dead, imagine the stunning silence and shock and awe throughout the fallen one-third realm. Plans, their well-laid plans for eons of time failed. They thought they had him right where they wanted him. And they failed. Imagine now that they turn against one another, even more so than before, before they became united against Jesus. Imagine now how ripped apart Lucifer's kingdom is. And imagine now in his fury and his rage through fear and punishment, he bears down on those who were once loyal to him. He bears down even to his most loyal ones. Because he's Mr. Egocentric. <laughs> okay? And his top plan failed. And everything is falling apart, so he's going to even dig deeper into that realm of rage and fear and punishment to bring order out of his chaos. His way of bringing order out of chaos. God's way. His way. Okay? So his plans were foiled. And so the church was born. The church of Jesus Christ was born and has moved forward. And so when he is he he and his angels are cast down to the earth once again, implying that there was a former time when they were cast down, but then they lifted themselves back up, and that's born as hinted at in Ezekiel twenty eight, twelve through nineteen, as towards the end of that stretch you'll find it. The origin of the Phoenix. It's right there in the verse. <laughs> okay? It's right there. And the origin of the phoenix is also referenced, but not typically understood as such, in, his, in Isaiah chapter 14, the famous five I wills. So Lucifer is uttering these five I wills from a POV point of view from being earthbound. When he was first cast down and his angels cast down, kind of like phase-locked into here, or maybe the solar system, I don't know, but their determination to rise above those five I wills, to rise above, to defy God's judgments. And so the war continues. Okay, The war continues back and forth, even into our time and beyond. So right here, and God is saying, where, where, are you, where are you coming from? As if God didn't know, right? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, and then the same thing over here in uh, Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve had just sinned, and they're hiding themselves. And verse 8 here, chapter 3, verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? There's a lot here. The trees in the garden, there's a physical reality to that, but there's also a like a supernatural reality to trees of the garden. Okay, that I'll probably de- delve into next time or something. Um, <clears throat> our physical realm that is to us, we're very myopic, uh, extremely myopic, thinking that this physical realm is it, you know, and the earth is only pebble on the beach. <laughs> if it was only pebble on the beach, there wouldn't be a beach, okay? It'd just be a pebble. It takes a lot of pebbles to make up a beach, okay? So, uh, a lot of things, there's a physical component, you know, a natural component, and there's a supernatural component to a lot of what's in the creation accounts, in this Genesis accounts, okay? So trees of the garden has a different, has a supernatural meaning also, so we'll get into that next time. But do you think, you know, God, you know, all creation, he's got a zillion things to keep on his mind all the time, right? Zillions of things all the time. And he's got to have his, his thumb on the pulse of everything that's going on, right? And so, you know, he kind of, forgot where Adam and Eve were, right? He kind of forgot where they were. So he's coming down and, uh, you know, the uh, 
the place where they typically would meet up in the cool of the evening of every day and, and fellowship, right? And they're not there, so he just doesn't know where they are. You know, it's like, oh, I don't know where they are. So I'm going to have to call out to them because I'm not picking up on them. I just don't. They're not here. I, I, I don't know where they are, okay? And do you think in Job chapter uh, chapter 1 here, that God, from where you come, he's asking Satan, like, God didn't know. You know, he's getting kind of old. You know, he's been around for a long time. Maybe he's getting, like, Alzheimer's, and he just can't keep track of everything anymore. So he just had no foggy idea where Satan was coming from. Do you think that's it? <laughs> I think not, okay? <laughs> there's there's a reason why God asks Lucifer, you know, Satan, where are you coming from? And then we get over to Adam and Eve, where are you? Okay. It's not like God didn't know where they were physically, and he didn't know where they were spiritually. It's not like God didn't know where Satan had been cast down to and where he was running around the place. Okay, It's not like God didn't know. He's asking these questions for a reason. Okay, And we're getting it up to the top of the hour, and I'll continue with this line of discussion next time. <laughs> There's a lot to it. Praise God. Awesome. Thank you for joining us for the Peterson Chronicles, Angel Wars and the Luciferian Rebellion show number. Let's, well, I might have it right this time. I don't know, but I think it's 222. But I don't know. I already see yeah. that mistake in one of my notes here, so who knows what show it is. Uh, anyway, praise God. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you Amen. all next Saturday night. Praise God. Thank you. Amen. Amen.